dear Lydia, thank you very much for coming. Um, our uh, president of the forum, our Caesar, Professor Avramovich, unfortunately won't be with us tonight, though he's closer to you than to us currently. He's our ambassador in the Vatican, so he's there in Rome, but he has some important business dinner tonight, so he won't be able to join us. Otherwise, he would usually be opening the meeting. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Lydia Zanetti Dominguez, who is a very talented young researcher from Milano, but also from the University of London Institute of Historical Research. <clears throat> I first met Lydia, what was it now, three years ago almost, at a conference in Oxford that Lydia and two other colleagues were organizing, and that was wonderful. And since then, a nice volume from the conference has been published. So Lydia is dealing in medieval history, mostly in Italian medieval history, as far as I know, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong. And she has a book published recently that I haven't had the time to read yet, but I'll get around to it, I promise. It looks promise. very interesting. And tonight's lecture uh, will have something to do with the subjects that she has been working on in the book. So the subject is Penitential Spirituality and Criminal Justice in Late Medieval Italy, the case of Siena, 13th, 14th century. So it's very interesting from both a legal and a general historical point of view. Thank Lydia, you very much, Nina. The floor is yours. I'm going to try and uh, share my screen and uh... If it doesn't work, please let it me know. It works. We <laughs> see it. Another issue. But yeah, it's, it's all we right. Can we can see okay, everything. Perfect. So thank you again, Nina, and thank you everyone for coming to, to listen to my talk. As Nina said, I deal mostly with uh, late medieval uh, history and the history of criminal justice in particular. And uh, today I would like uh, to um, focus on the idea that penitential spirituality, so the spirituality based on uh, the sacrament of confession and on the idea that confession should be sort of a lifestyle and pen penance should be enacted by all people in society to create a good order is central to my presentation. So um, my idea is that penitential spirituality offered a model uh, of criminal justice in late medieval Italy, and therefore it is important to understand it, to uh, have a more broader understanding of uh, late medieval Italian, but more generally uh, Western European society. So I would like to start by defining what I mean by a model of criminal justice. Um, so historians and anthropologists in recent years have pointed out how a variety of modern and pre-modern societies, European and non-European, have established a broadly coherent framework of rules and categories that define what constitutes rightful or wrongful behavior in a given society and which create in this way a model of good order. So as you can see, this definition comes from the work of a medievalist, Tom Lambert, that is very much influenced by legal anthropology. Uh, and indeed, this concept of model of criminal justice or, or of justice more generally uh, has been very much influenced by the latest debates in legal anthropology and uh, historical studies that often are in a dialogue with each other. And it is connected to a a rebirth of sort of a renewed normative approach to legal anthropology. And what I mean by this is that traditionally, until the second half of the 20th century, uh, legal anthropology approached uh, the study of law in different societies uh, through the lens of mostly legal codifications and the institutions that created these codifications. And uh, this approach had been seen as uh, limited by uh, the proponents of a concurrent processual approach that emerged from the 50s on, but it became particularly prominent from, uh, from the 70s on. And here I have put some references to the work of legal anthropologists that have uh, contributed to create this model. So according to this model, 
uh, it is not sufficient to focus on uh, legal codifications uh, because we need also to take into account the variety of social actors actually involved in a conflict and uh, the fact that codified laws are often inadequate to describe what happened for what happens for real in concrete situations. So it is not by chance that the proponents of this approach uh, were um, prevalently Africanist anthropologists, because of course, this focus on, on written legal codifications was considered by them to be ethnocentric, as well as the focus on sort of formal ways of uh, uh, conflict resolution. Uh, whereas instead in the traditional normative approach, uh, oral cultures and informal ways of uh, uh, solve disputes were seen as sort of more primitive um, and typical of cultures that were outside of Europe. So this was, of course, uh, a great input to legal anthropology and a great correction to this approach. And uh, from the very beginning, it captured the attention also of historians of the Middle Ages. And in Italy, this approach has been used since the 90s by scholars such as Andrea Zorzi to study the role of revenge and informal mechanisms of dispute resolution in the Italian commune. But from the beginning of this century, new forms of collaboration between historians and anthropologists have led to the revision of this paradigm uh, as also somehow limited. Uh, so as you can see, this happened prominently in the Anglophone context, uh, but uh, it had repercussions on the history of the Italian Middle Ages from the very beginning. As you can see, the first book is a book uh, by Chris Wickham that highlighted the dialectic between norms and social practices in the study of disputes in 12th century Tuscany. So it is exactly this dialectic between norms and practices that is central to this renewed normative approach that has led to um, the definition of this concept of models of justice. And uh, in this approach, norms are defined not as predictive of human behavior in the way that a scientific law can predict a physical phenomenon, which was kind of the approach of the traditional uh, normative uh, way of dealing with legal anthropology, but norms instead are seen as the structuring concepts that guide the actions of those involved in a conflict, even when they do not respect them, and therefore provide a general model of uh, good order. And therefore, uh, we can also understand that in a given society, there could be more than one model of criminal justice. And this is something that uh, has been uh, particularly uh, underlined by legal scholars in uh, in works about multi-legalism or plural uh, plural um, legalism, uh, sorry, uh, legal pluralism. Um, so, of course, this is very, very valid for the Middle Ages, as you can imagine, because there was a plurality of, uh, uh, of norms, if you think about canon law and, uh, and civil law and all sorts of uh, um, norms that applied to more specific categories like the law of merchants and so on. Clearly, there must have been a multiplicity of models also when it came to, to criminal justice in the Italian communes. And also, according to this definition of norms, we don't have to focus only on written legal codifications, but also on other types of norms, as we, as we will see, spiritual norms, but also family obligations and this type of uh, organizing concepts of society. So my approach is exactly based on this renewed normative approach to the study of, uh, of law. Uh, and it is an approach that, of course, doesn't exclude the study of what happened in practice and the study of practice more generally, but tries to combine theory and practice to see how they influenced each other. And this is particularly important to understand whether these models are purely aspirational. So they, they're just meant to connect local life and uh, universal principles, or whether there are actually pressure groups that campaign to put these models into practice. So the reason why I chose the Italian commune of Siena as my case study uh, was the fact that we have uh, 
a broad variety of uh, sources available for, for this city in particular. And by this, I do not mean only uh, statutes, uh, um, codifications uh, and court cases, but we also have a number of religious sources, in particular saints' lives and hagiographies. And that is what sets the book apart from other studies, let's say, of communal Italy, as you will see. And of course, in my choice of period, to analyze, I chose exactly this, this time frame because many other studies have pointed out that it is from the second half of the 13th century that criminal justice is established as a reality in its own right within jurisprudence. And we see a flourishing of treaties of, of criminal justice, in particular the most famous one of uh, Albertus Gandinus, but there are others. Um, so, of course, when I started my analysis of the variety of models of criminal justice that were available in Siena in this period, I relied on previous works by historians that I had already identified ways of talking about criminal justice in the Italian communes, even though maybe they didn't use the term model in particular. There are two main models, uh, the way I call them, or, you know, discourses of criminal justice that can be found in uh, the Italian communes in general, and of course, Siena as well. And the first one has been dubbed the culture of revenge. And it is a model centered on honor as a fundamental resource for the individual and the group to which they belong. So the idea underlying this model is that uh, crime is a private matter between the parties involved, and it, it is therefore up to a victim or the family of a victim, in case the victim has died, uh, to take care of, uh, of uh, the management of the crime, the, the repression of the crime, by taking their revenge on the enemy to restore the honor that was lost originally on account of the affront. Uh, so this has to be done publicly because everyone has to know that the honor of the family or of the individual has been restored. And uh, there is a, a strong centrality of emotional satisfaction in the, in the legitimation of, of this model, uh, because, of course, the idea is that uh, revenge is not taken out of respect for abstract principles of justice or injustice, or to deter people from committing crimes by setting a good example. Revenge is taken because of this emotional satisfaction that uh, the victim of a crime uh, obtains when taking their revenge. And this is particularly evident in this quotation uh, from the Libro di Buoni Costumi, that is uh, the, the book of good habits by the merchant uh, and writer Paolo da Certaldo, who lived in Florence in the 14th century. So this is a book that was meant to give advice to people on how to behave in communal society. And uh, the quote is, the first cause of happiness is to take one's revenge, that of sorrow is being offended by one's enemy. So clearly, I mean, the reason why one takes uh, their revenge is because it causes great happiness to have their honor restored and their social uh, standing recognized by everyone. On the other hand, we have, and it's not working anymore, it's not moving, okay, it is moving now, the ideology of public order. So in this case, this idea of criminal justice emerges in the second half of the 13th century or in the 13th century more broadly, depending on, on where you are. Whereas the culture of revenge we have just talked about uh, can be found also previously. Like there are many chansons de geste, there are many sagas in which you find the same principles of the culture of revenge, but like in the high and early Middle Ages, you don't find as many statements related to the ideology of the public order. And the central tenet that encapsulates this ideology is the one that I have uh, uh, put here in the slide, that is, it is of public interest that crimes are not, uh, are not left unpunished. So this sentence uh, first appears in uh, papal decretals and in canon law texts, as uh, is explained by 
Freiherr in his article, uh, which I have put on the slide, because if you're interested in the history of this concept, this is the, the best article that is available. And he really reconstructs the emergence of this idea. But it's, despite coming from uh, canon law, you find it everywhere. It is really ubiqu ubiquitous in uh, communal sources from this period in Italy. And I have found many, many instances of this concept expressed in this way or a bit differently in my Sienese sources. And the, the two important points that we have to understand about this model are both present in this uh, statement or catchphrase. That, that's why it's so useful to, to you know, uh, have it in front of us. So the first thing is the idea that crime is a public matter and not a private one. So it has to be um, repressed not by the victims, but by the public institution, that is the commune, and on the basis of a series of abstract principles of justice or injustice, such as the idea of maintaining a good public order, which must be reflected in the written laws of the commune or the statutes. So this idea of good public order is also ubiquitous in communal sources from the period. It's often expressed as the bonus et pacificus status of the commune, the good and peaceful state of the commune. And it really becomes a very important part of the political ideology of communal governments in this period. The second point we have to take into account is the centrality of punishment which is very obvious from this statement. So unlike in the previous model, there is a need for formalized punishment and for setting a good example, whereas the emotional satisfaction of the parties involved in a given conflict or dispute is completely secondary. That is, in the culture of revenge, we have cases in which the avenger is happy with just being recognized as fearsome by their enemy, they don't get anything back, nothing in terms of money, or they don't even have to beat the person up in order to, to restore their honorability. And therefore, you know, it is sufficient to, to, to have this public recognition of their status. Whereas in the ideology of public order, you have to have a fine or a, a corporal punishment, some type of for, formalized punishment. So these two models are clearly contradictory. And despite much research, it is not really clear how they could coexist. So often it has been said that the culture of revenge was what happened for real in practice, whereas this ideology of public order was indeed purely ideological, a way of legitimizing shaky governments that you know, promoted themselves as, uh, as governments that could uh, repress crime effectively, but actually no one cared about these ideological formulations. But that is not true, of course. I mean, that's a simplistic way of putting it. And also in practice, we see also that from the second half of the 13th century, there are more condemnations meted out by local governments. There are, there's more frequent recourse to corporal punishments and there are limitations to the value of private peace agreements. So if two people who are in conflict and committed crimes against each other decide to write a peace charter, make peace privately, that's not anymore recognized by the commune as something that closes the question completely. So in order to understand how this system functioned, I have tried to ask myself if maybe there were other models that we haven't taken into account so far at, and that can contribute to our understanding of how these different ways of perceiving criminal justice could work together. And I have, of course, uh, decided to have a look at uh, religious sources because of recent um, scholarship that has underlined the, impor the importance of also studying religious conceptions of justice, revenge and mercy in order to understand how they interacted with secular ones. And that, as you can see, this is also something that has been done for the most part in the Anglophone world. And uh, that is very, very recent. These books came out while I was writing my doctoral thesis that then uh, has been published in the form of a book. So, I mean, it was, of course, very exciting to be part of sort of a group of scholars working on the same thing at the same time. It was quite anxiety inducing to think that they were publishing while I was trying to write and maybe they will write everything that I already wanted to say. Anyway, so 
I have uh, decided to start with uh, this example to show what kind of conception of criminal justice and of dispute resolution um, religious sources from that time could offer. And as you will see, it is really based on the idea of penance as a, as a central element of Christian life. So this in particular is an excerpt from the life of the Sienese lay penitent uh, Pietro Pettinaio, who lived uh, in the 13th century, even though the Vita is from the 14th. So in this excerpt, uh, Pietro is uh, praying in the Church of St. Francis when a man called Mino comes into the church. And here I quote the text. He had received an injury from another man and that the prompting of the devil believed he had been greatly offended. He had resolved to murder his enemy and had not told anyone. Resolving one night to carry out this homicide, he went to San Francesco, the church, the following morning to see the elevation of the host and to commend himself to it, and then to go and carry out his evil intent. But the divine goodness revealed this to Pietro, who called Mino aside in the church and said, my dearest brother, if you carry out this murder, you will lose your soul. And know that this morning, as you commend yourself to Christ the Savior, he is giving you this counsel, and know that this is the will of God. Mino reflected that no one could have known this except by divine revelation. And he said to him, My dearest father, pray to God for me that he will pardon me, for I have offended his goodness in my evil desire to commit murder. And because when I commended myself to his most old holy body, he has come so swiftly to my aid and can called me back from this evil. Oh, gosh. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know why, but I lost control of my PowerPoint. No oh, problem. No, uh, it's, it's yeah. back. Uh, don't know why, but it, it is a bit tricky. Anyway, so I was, I was saying that uh, um, Mino decides not to commit his crime and goes home, as the text says, in much peace and tranquility of spirit. So what should we make of this uh, excerpt? So one point that we have to take into account is the usage of the lexicon of penance and confession. So one thing that I have underlined in orange is uh, are the expressions counsel and aid. These expressions can be connected to the Latin uh, phrase consilium et auxilium, which is uh, the practice and the expectation that someone's friends would provide help in cases of doubtful questions and in particular of conflict so that the person could take their revenge. It was a mark of friendship, the idea that someone would provide you with help and advice. But in texts, friendship was connected to um, confession. That is, friendship was the way in which the relationship between man and God was described in the context of confession, because of course confession required trust in order to confess your sins to the priest to receive the absolution. And also the emotional dynamic is the dynamic that was seen as central in the sacrament of confession. So in this period, contrition, the, the feeling of sorrow for one's sin, is uh, uh, defined as a, as a central aspect of the sacrament of confession. Without this feeling, confession is not valid and the absolution doesn't serve any purpose. So here we see, and I have also uh, underlined the expressions that are related to emotions, uh, that the person, the, that Mino, uh goes through an emotional path that uh, starts from the desire to commit a sin and then through contrition leads to spiritual joy the peace and tranquility of spirit that is kind of the religious equivalent of the happiness uh, for committing one's revenge that we have previously seen so contrition that springs from a penitent attitude and that prompts enemies to make peace with each other is proposed by this author as a remedy to interpersonal violence without any involvement of the local government. So the proposed solution, sorry, and again, why is it not? Okay, now it's working. Um, I was saying that the solution involves the promotion of self-control. 
that is a change in the individual attitudes towards conflict and not instead the expansion of social control, which is the role of institutional constraints in regulating violent behavior. And that instead, as we have seen, was central both in the model of the culture of revenge, in which it was really important to have like a public recognition of the restoration of one's honor and in the ideology of the public order where punishments had to be uh, meted out to set an example for the community to, to sort of give judgment uh, like in, in the sense of uh, moral judgment uh, of criminals. Um, so situations related to criminal justice were presented as dilemmatic, like as, as causes of moral dilemmas. We have seen it before in the text by, about Pietro Pettinaio, uh, the, the need to ask for advice about whether to take one's revenge off or not, hints at the fact that there were doubts that this was a completely legitimate way of reacting to, to a dispute. Uh, and this is because uh, religious actors were conscious that there were structural differences between models and that all models were based on very important values uh, within the community. So, of course, honor, as we have seen, was a fundamental value, but so was the desire to achieve one's salvation or the desire to uh, behave as a good citizen, to uphold the good and peaceful state of the community. So, I think it is pretty clear from quotes like this one that religious actors were conscious of the difficulty inherent in deciding for a model or for another. So this is a sermon by Ambrogio Sansedoni, a Dominican from 13th century Siena, in which he tries to imagine the way a victim of a crime feels uh, between sort of the, the reason of the anxiety is the is having to decide between the obligation to take one's revenge, so this sort of family and societal obligation, uh, and on the other hand, more intimate worries, that is the worries to lose one's soul. He says, if I abandon my resentment and hate towards this person, I will be shamed, but if I don't, I will lose my soul. And the solution also here is confession, like the idea that going to confession and confessing to one's uh, feeling of resentment can lead to the path of uh, tranquility, which is exactly the word that Ambrogio uses. Here, I've just put a picture of the manuscript to show you what it looks like, but my sources are not a flashy uh, medieval manuscript full of illuminations. So, I mean, I just wanted to, to, to show you what, what these type of documents can look like in 13th century Siena. So, the models that I have described so far are kind of abstractions that appear in this pure form only in programmatic documents which describe precisely how things should go. But in practice, they are often mixed. And there are at least two elements that favor this interconnection between models. So the first of all is reference to a common vocabulary. We have seen it in the case of a concilium et auxilium. It could be used in secular contexts to mean one thing and in religious contexts to mean another thing. The relationship of amicizia and inimicizia, of friendship and enmity, is also central to all the models I have uh, uh, described. So amicizia in the case of uh, the culture of revenge is friendship, is like the link between people that belong to the same family, to the same circle. In some way, they are linked together. Whereas in religious contexts is the spiritual relationship between God and, uh, and uh, the penitent. And in the ideology of public order, uh, these, these relationships are often used, for instance, to describe criminals as enemies of the city and lawful citizens as friends of the city. Also, the concept of peace that, of course, is present in all these um, models can mean very different things. So, Pax, that is peace, can mean the peace charter uh, that is written at the end of a conflict to sort of um, end the dispute, but it could also mean the, the feeling, as we have seen, of peace that one obtains when they repent for their crimes. So uh, two completely different things, but because they use the same words, the word can, can take on more than one meaning, which facilitates uh, connections between models. And another 
thing that facilitated this interaction between models was the fact that carriers of the religious models, of course, priests, members of the mendicant orders, but also lay penitents, so lay people that decided to live a, a more intense religious life, such as the case of Pietro Pettinaio. So these carriers of religious models acted as a pressure group campaigning to enact the principles behind the penitential model of criminal justice. So what did they try to campaign for? They campaigned for the enlargement of the spaces granted to mercy in the system of uh, criminal justice of Siena, for instance, by introducing ritual releases of prisoners, amnesties and special treatment for poor and illiterate prisoners and also the promotion of the emotional style that was associated with their model of criminal justice. Uh, for instance, here I've decided to um, take an example that is not from Siena to show how this is not an, an idiosyncrasy from the Commune of Siena, but it can be found a bit everywhere. So this is, these are the statutes of the rural commune, commune of Dervio in the province of Lecco, so in northern Italy, much, much northern than much more to the north than Siena, um, near Milan, near where I live. So uh, this chapter from the statutes says that uh, if someone goes to the, the house of a person in the territory of Dervio during the night and enters it for any reason, if he has not first warned those in the house of his present, uh, he, presence, he shall be fined two pounds each time if he's unarmed and four pounds if he carries weapons. But if anyone has gone to the house of another person or has presented himself at the door of an inhabitant in anger and armed with the intention of injuring someone or in any case to outer damage, he shall be fined five pounds each time if it is daytime and ten pounds if it is nighttime. So you can see here that Anger is an aggravating factor and it is connected to uh, intentionality. And this is very much a feature of the conception of emotions that was uh, uh, supported by, by uh, religious actors in this period, according to which emotions were part of human physiology, but as soon as the will assented to put them into practice uh, through words or deeds or even just thoughts, then it became something intentional. And so this anger we see here is equivalent to the scene of wrath, the capital scene. And this is very interesting because this idea that anger is actually the product of, of a conscious decision and therefore a sign of intentionality is a, a, a typical Italian thing that we don't find uh, elsewhere in, uh, in um, Western Europe. For instance, in France or England instead, anger was considered to be a mitigating factor. Um, so I think this is really the sign of, of, a, of a, an influence of religious circles, because in France or England, the only context in which you find the same conception of anger in court cases uh, is the case of ecclesiastical courts. So for instance, in England, uh, wives could obtain a divorce if they could demonstrate that the husband had beaten them in a state of anger, because to prove domestic violence in this judicial context, you had to be able to distinguish corporal punishment delivered judiciously and calmly for the improvement of the victim's behavior, that was, uh, of course, legitimate back then, from violence deriving solely from cruelty or passion or sin, of course, that if a woman managed to um to prove that their husband had um, had beaten them uh, in a state of anger then then uh, he was at fault and a divorce could be obtained so who were the bearers of these uh, three models because of course we know that if someone belonged to the clergy if someone was a lay penitent probably they adhered to the model of uh, the, the penitential model of criminal justice but what about the rest of the lay people in the city of Siena? How influential were these conceptions on them? So I tried to have a look at it by doing a prosopographical studies of some councillors that uh, were very present in the most important city council of the city of Siena, that is the general council of the commune from the 1270s to the 1290s. 
So because they are very vocal and they intervene many times in the council, you can kind of track their positions on questions of public order. So we have Ciampo Albizzi and Arrigola Carigi, who both intervened on different occasions to express their concern for the problem of criminality and rebellions and to support motions in favor of assigning extraordinary inquisitorial and coercive powers in Latin arbitrium inquirendi et torquendi to the podesta, that is to the uh, main judicial officer of the commune. But they really differed on uh, their opinions about the penitential model because Arrigola Carigi, uh, on the occasion, on one occasion in which uh, a liberation of poor prisoners for religious reasons was proposed by the friars of the city, he argued that such a display of mercy that involved the release of uh, guilty criminals could be detrimental for the public order of the city. So his adherent, uh, adherence to the um, ideology of public order was, of course, very strong, and he couldn't get over it, sort of. Like, not even for religious reasons would he make exceptions to, to his ideas, whereas Ciampola Albizzi voted in favor of it. Then we even have members of the General Council that had a remarkable criminal records, re record themselves, such as the case of uh, Scozia Tolomei. So uh, he was the leader of a violent revolt against the commune in the years uh, 1270 to 1271. So it is not surprising that when he was readmitted to the city council, he did not su support the proposal to increase the severity of the legislation against crime, but he tended to support acts of mercy against criminal proposed by the general council. So these three people belong to the same social class, that is the financial and military elite or aristocracy, we can call it, of the commune of Siena. But they present very different views on criminal justice. So it is really not a question of social class, which is an important point to make because it had been argued previously that members of these uh, financial and military elite called the Magnati in the Italian communes would be supporters of the culture of revenge because the culture of revenge involves an aristocratic conception of violence in which you're kind of like authorized to, to act violently against your enemies. Whereas the ideology of the public order would be uh, supported by a new elite that emerged in the second half of the 13th century, the elite of uh, merchants and craftsmen known as the Popolo. But this analysis doesn't support this conclusion. And it's not even a question of family allegiance, as, uh, as far as we, as we can uh, tell, because uh, members of the same family, for instance, the, the Ptolemy family, which was a huge patrilinear group, do not always vote uh, uh, in the same way when it comes to questions of criminal justice, whereas uh, in other cases we see them as acting together as representatives of the family. In the case of Ciampolo Albizzi, what is really, really fun, for me, not for him probably, uh, is the fact that if we look at lists of condemnations uh, passed in Siena, um, we discovered that his son Petruccio had been condemned to a £1,000 fine for the homicide of a Castellanuccio di Franco Castellani and together with some accomplices to another fine for the abduction of a man called Vina Lamberti. So he was a hardened criminal sort of and this is like the entitled violent behavior that was often associated with the, the civic aristocracy as I've, I've mentioned but his father was a staunch supporter for stronger measures against crime. So we must consider that it mustn't have been only a question, as I said, of, of a social class or of family allegiance, but it, it had to be a question also of personal inclinations, spiritual ties, and a lot of elements that we cannot really figure out from the sources that are available because they're really, really personal and, and we don't have traces of them. So to conclude, I think that uh, the evolution of criminal justice in Siena, but in general in the Italian communes, can be explained better if we don't think of these courses of criminal justice as a dichotomy between a private model of criminal justice based on revenge 
and a public model of criminal justice based on the statutes and on uh, civic courts and on you know a more formalized type of justice we should really see it as a complex system in which uh, many models were could coexist together because interactions were facilitated by commonalities and in particular by a sort of a mediation function between models covered by these third penitential model of criminal justice however of course the weight of th these three models was different in different countries or even in different Italian communes. We have seen already the fact that in France or England, uh, anger was a mitigating instead of an aggravating factor. And even within Italy, we know that Florence maintained vendetta as a legal custom until the end of the Middle Ages, whereas Siena and the majority of the other Italian communes made it illegal already in the 13th century, if not in the 14th in some cases. So how can we explain these differences? So here I've tried to come up with a couple of explanations. So Roman law was extraneous to the institution of the feud and it had a higher level of legalism. Uh, so the, uh, the adherence to uh, Roman law as, as a guiding principle of the, of the local legislation must have had an influence on the development of criminal justice. And we know, for instance, that Siena adopted uh, Roman law formally in the 12th century, whereas the Florence maintained Lombard law at the core of its legal system throughout this period. Uh, Siena, moreover, was an important center of Roman jurisprudence. It had a, a, a university focusing on the teaching of law uh, since 1240. It's still there, as you can see. This is the seal of the university, and they're very proud of uh, their antiquity. But at the same time, I think that the reference to the importance of Roman law, the influence of Roman law, cannot be the only explanation. Because first of all, specific connections to Roman law seem to have been avoided in these communes uh, because legal professionals generally belong to the magnati class, so to the civic aristocracy uh, and the popolo elites that took the, uh, the power in the 13th century didn't want to have too much a connection with it. And also, um, Roman legislation, Justinianic legislation, was very associated with the empire, the emperor uh, that had fought against the communes to, to uh, sort of regain sovereignty on the communes. So specific connections were avoided. Of course, like Roman law was very much studied in Italy, but like as, as a, a guiding principle, often, you know, it was put in a, on, like on the background, sort of. And also some principles of, uh, of Roman law kind of clashed with uh, the penitential model that I have described. For instance, the principle of criminal presumption that argued for the regularity of human behavior. That is, once you have committed a crime, you're always going to be a criminal. You're going to, to commit more crimes because you are a criminal. Of course, this invalidates the potential for change represented by repentance. So another explanation we have to take also into account is the importance of local religiosity and local cults. So of course, the mendicant orders, the friars and the penitents had a very strong hold on the communes of Italy and not as much potentially in other contexts, such as England or France. But also within Italy, we should consider that local cults differed from a commune to another. So in the case of Siena in particular, the city was an important center of Marian devotion, of the cult of the Virgin Mary. And here I put a coin. It's from the 14th century because I couldn't find 13th century coins of this type, but they exist. And in the legend, you can see that Siena is described as the ancient city of the Virgin. In 1260, Siena had dedicated itself to the Virgin Mary and made it the head and the defender of the city in the wake of a very important battle, the Battle of Montaperti that Siena won. And of course, that was uh, connected to the idea that it had dedicated itself to the Virgin Mary. And the Virgin in this period was increasingly associated with uh, mercy as its main attribute uh, all over Europe. And our Lady of Mercy, which is a virgin that 
shelters the faithful with her cloak has become a popular European iconography in this period. So I think that societies in which the Virgin was a, seen as a, the pattern of the city, the, the, the defender and head of the commune, might have been more prone to incorporate mercy also in their systems of criminal justice compared to other cities where other cults were prominent. I hope I haven't been too boring. <laughs> and also because I started with a, with a delay, I hope I haven't talked for too long. And I thank you very, very much for your attention. I think I will stop. Thank you very much, Lydia. You weren't boring at all. This was okay. very interesting and I hope there will be some questions. So everyone feel free to either turn on your camera and microphone and ask your questions orally or if you can't for whatever reason you may type them in the chat and while people are thinking i will abuse the privilege to ask you a few things myself first of all i'm curious when you're talking about the idea of uh the public order in criminal justice so the the state the commune is the one who has to punish the criminals and let no crime go unpunished mm -hmm. can you give any sort of chronology when are we going from simply the state should be the one in charge of uh, criminal trials and private vendettas should be outlawed to some sort of state persecution ex officio for the crimes. Mm -hmm. I can give you a, an, an example from medieval Serbia simply to, to, to clarify what I mean. For example, um, the period that we have more or less covered by sources is from the late 12th, early 13th century, and we already have no mention of private vendettas in that period. The closest to it is in Dushan's code, so that's mid 14th century, that the person who initiated a fight uh, is considered to be guilty even if he's the one killed, but that's more of a self-defense principle. Mm -hmm. uh, but only then in the mid 14th century do we have public persecution for some crimes, and that's for professional brigands and thieves, so for, for what was more or less the organized crime for the Middle Ages, while things such as murder or rape or so on were still persecuted at courts, but by the victim or their family. So what's the situation like in Siena in that respect? Okay, so uh, this is extremely interesting because, of course, instead in in Europe you have you have references to vendetta until very late. I mean, in in the early modern period, it, it is something that is socially acceptable until quite a late period, uh, but it becomes not legally accepted anymore. So there, there is a distinction between the, the social acceptability of revenge that is maintained throughout the period. You, you always find someone that is in favor of taking one's revenge. I mean, I think if you asked people in Italy to this day, you would find supporters of revenge. But the, the legal acceptability of the practice uh, changes in, in, in the period that I'm talking about. Like, I think late, very late, uh, 13th century to early 14th, and it depends, of course, on the city. So we know, for instance, from we have some early 13th century um, statutes from cities like Parma, in which it is not entirely clear whether vendetta was still legal, but generally the interpretations are in favor of the legality of vendetta, like they people interpret it as, as a proof that vendetta was still legal. But then from the 1280s, I think, in Siena, you really see it's not legal anymore. And, and you see that, for instance, um, because, I mean, some people have argued that it was still legal if it stayed within certain boundaries. For instance, if you, if you killed the person who had injured you and not their relatives, or, or if you injured the person who had injured you and not his relatives. But actually, that's not the case. Like we have court cases in which even people who follow the, the rules of vendetta, so they they actually uh, took their event on the right person, 
were still condemned. So the question of uh, uh, ex officio jurisprudence um, is also a bit uh, complicated. Like in this period, we see that it becomes much more common to have uh, ex officio cases. It's mostly in, in Siena, it is for professional thieves, but it's also for murder. Murder is definitely covered by this uh, because it is considered something that that damages the public order. So it's it's professional theft with violence involved. So like brigands, this sort of highway robbery style of crimes, but also murder. Uh, I now do not recall whether, you know, rape was a crime that could be investigated ex officio. But like there was a category of enormous crimes, including arson, for instance, including treason, including uh, crimen lese majestatis, that were also um, prosecuted ex officio. But even in the case of an accusatorial trial, you still had some elements of this ideology of the public order. So you didn't need to have an ex officio trial to have, for instance, a case in which a private piece was not recognized, in which revenge was not allowed, you know, because until some point in the late 13th century to early 14th, and that depends also on the city, if you had a peace charter that proved that you had made peace with the, the, your victim or the family of your victim, either you would be acquitted completely, like the, the trial would stop existing, or at least you would receive a, a more lenient punishment, like a lower fine, for instance. But at some point, this doesn't really matter anymore, uh, because there is this idea expressed by Albertus Gandinus that it's it, there's still the inuria republice, the offense to the to the government that has to be taken care of, sort of. So yeah, late 13th century, I would say, and also in accusatorial trials. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, it's particularly important that murder is included there because when you include uh, treason, offenses against the government and so on, the government is sort of the victim there. So naturally, nobody else would be persecuting, but it's important that, that murder was already... Yeah, yeah. And, and arson as well, which is also yes. like a crime, of course, with, with a, a public sort of... Uh dimension that's at the yes same. because it's a great da danger in yeah. the middle ages <laughs> yeah. particularly in cities i presume where a single fire could burn the city down if it went yeah. out of control mm -hmm. and just one more little thing perhaps it's a completely wrong association but uh, when you mentioned concilium et auxilium in the context of friendship I know in some other medieval societies, England, for example, it's considered a part of feudal relations. So concilium et auxilium is a part of uh, vassal's duties uh, towards their lord. Is there anything in that context here where those two men in the example, perhaps in some sort of uh, relationship that isn't a proper vassal relationship, of course, but with one being subordinate to the other, or am I on the wrong track? I mean, yeah, that that also in Italy, like we find early instances from, I don't know, 11th, 12th century in which the expression is referred to uh, the relationship between a vassal and uh, and a lord. Um, so it comes from, from that vocabulary for sure. Um, in Italy, it can either have this meaning, like in which there is a sort of an unequal relationship between the parties involved, but also just among friends. Because for instance, Al uh, Albertano da Brescia, who was a jurist from 13th century Brescia and wrote uh, a treatise about uh, advice, about giving advice. And it's a case of revenge. It's a man who, whose uh, daughter and wife have been injured by his enemies. So what he decides to do is he calls, he summons all his friends, relatives, everyone, to give him advice. And here you can see that there are there are some people that maybe, you know, want something in exchange, like they are in a position in a subordinate position and they expect protection from uh, from this this guy, from the protagonist of the, of the treatise, because he's rich and he's a member of the local elite. But there are also just like people in a in a completely horizontal relationship with him of just really 
friendship. Of course, by friendship, I don't mean the same concept that we have nowadays in which it's, it's purely a question of personal feelings and inclinations. It's like friendship is what you expect from people in your, on, on your, like that are part of your political faction, for instance, like the Italian communes were characterized by, you know, the existence of this Guelph and Ghibelline faction, the, the Popolo and the Magnati, then the Guelphs, maybe in some communes they split into the white Guelphs, the, the black Guelphs. So like, there were these political allegiances that of course were, were also include, like friendship was also part of, of political relationships or of familial relationships, like there was this sense of obligation towards members of your family, of your party, of your neighborhood sometimes, and of your uh, craft association. So members of the same guild were supposed to be in a relationship of amicizia and therefore offer a concilium and auxilium to one another. But it doesn't like it's it's not feudal in the sense that it implies a doubt this sort sort of like exchange of protection for support. Okay, thank you very much. Georgi Stepic has a question. Georgi, go ahead. Yes, first of all, uh, thank you for a wonderful lecture. And I would be interested in a small parallel with our uh, own medieval history, because you mentioned that anger is treated as an aggravating uh, factor rather than a mitigating or, or alleviatory. Well, in medieval Serbia, it's a rather similar situation because uh, sometimes uh, anger is not only considered an, aggra uh, an uh, aggravating factor, but also one of the elements of a crime because uh, certain crimes like, for instance, starting a fire can only be incriminating if it was done out of anger. You know, if you were, if you'd done it out of anger, then you would be punished with burning. And if you done it otherwise, you would just pay the fine of, you know, the damage that's been caused. So what I'm interested in is that in Siena or in other Italian communes, uh, do you see uh, anger in this sort of way, or is it more of the kind that it is an aggravating uh, factor in the in the crime itself? Thank you very much. I mean, uh, in the case you have described, it is really, really interesting. Thank you so much for the question. And I think I'll read a lot more about Serbian legislation. I hope there's something available in English because unfortunately I don't have any Serbian, but this is fascinating and I wonder why this is present in, in Serbian law and it's not present in, in other, you know, um, legal systems of, of Western Europe. But I mean, here we're talking about interpersonal crimes. I've never seen a mention of anger in a case of arson. Um, it is mostly like in the case of, you know, either injuries or murders, homicides. Um, and it is, it is connected to intentionality as in your example, because of course, like, I guess if you, if you put something on fire without one, like you're just neglecting, like you're being negligent in a situation, your level of intentionality is different from when you actually want to set something on fire to, to take your revenge on someone because you're angry with someone. Um, but like the idea here is that in many cultures, including in some ways ours, the, the fact of committing a crime in anger, like spur of the moment without premeditation is, is a mitigating factor. But here, you know, anger is connected to premeditation. Like you, you kind of wanted to, to commit a crime as opposed to, for instance, in a, in a brawl, in a fight, if someone gets killed, dies because of, of the injuries, but no one actually wanted to kill them. Maybe, you know, they, they hit their head uh, while fighting with someone and died. Then, of course, there, there was no anger involved. Like this was not intentional. Uh, whereas if you gave certain like if you if you sort of uh, wounded a person in certain ways by hitting them in specific places of the body, parts of the body and so on, and you did it out of anger, then then it was a different story. So I, I think, you know, there, there are more parallels than than differences, but I wonder if like the like if you find these 
examples of uh, of uh, anger as as an aggravating factor also in interpersonal crime or or not in in a in the Serbian legislation of the period, and whether you know we know where it comes from because I haven't found any instance of anger connected to intentionality in uh, Roman law or in canon law. Like the exp the expressions used, I haven't found them in in you know these sources of legislation, and not even in Lombard law because of course one might think well in Italy we had Lombard law maybe it comes from there. But it doesn't. So, yeah, my explanation was it comes from religious sources. But if we find it also in Serbian legislation, I don't know. Maybe it's a, it's like it's a Roman thing or Byzantine. I don't know. If I may just briefly intervene here, unless Georgi wanted to say something. Sorry. No, no. I just want to thank uh, uh, Miss Luisa for her answer. Okay. Uh, before I give uh, the word to the second, Georgi, who's asked uh, uh, for a word. Uh, the term that Georgi was talking about in Serbian law is pisma, and that's a very hard word to translate. It's not exactly anger. It does contain uh, an element of anger, but it's more perhaps maliciousness, so ill intent, perhaps even hatred. So in the uh, example of a crime, it, of the fire that Georgi mentioned, it's really if it's an ill intent, he wanted to harm someone by setting fire to someone's property, then it's the death penalty. Mm, there's also an example if a nobleman causes any sort of major damage like a fire or he demolishes something or something in the villages, on the territory under his control, and if he does so out of pisma, out of uh, malicious intent, then the the territory will be taken from out under his control. That doesn't mean he's entitled to do those things normally if it, if there's no ill intent, but he would probably just be liable for damages, and, and in this case he'll be far more severely penalized. But I can't think of any examples where it's an interpersonal crime. So it, it's an interesting issue. Yeah, it's, it's really it's really interesting. Maybe like at some point we could do some comparative work on, on these. The, there's an example again in the formation of a jury since the jury has to be more or less objective, there's a provision in Dushan's code that there can't be uh, a, a relative of either party in the jury or a pizmata, which is maybe an enemy, someone who hates either of the parties. So that person is also not eligible, but I, I can't think of anything else. And that's interesting anyway. If, if you have a bibliography in... Uh... Western European languages that uh, I would I would take it. I'll look something yeah. up. Yeah. I can give you a translation of Dushan's code certainly, and uh, I I can't think of off the top of my head. The uh, uh, Paolo Angelini has a book in Italian about uh, Dushan's uh, codification. Generally, I can't remember the title precisely, but it's been out a few years ago, maybe more Thank than a few you. by now, but. You can look that up. And now I'm afraid uh, the other Jodi put his hand down. Jodi, have you changed your mind or would you still like to ask your no, question? Uh, <laughs> I still have a question. Um, Go ahead. First of all, yeah, first of all, th thank you for the lecture. It was really interesting. And by answering to uh, the, the question of my colleague, you answered to one of two of my questions. Uh, I wanted to ask you uh, to, uh, it was particularly, particularly interesting uh, when you talked about emotions and how they can qualify a crime. And I wanted you to make some parallels with uh, today's intention in criminal law and which you did uh, in, by answering the other question. And uh, the second one was, 
um, uh, is there any evidence of uh, how do they prove uh, some particular emotion uh, in in a crime and how what what was the the proving the proving mechanism of uh, to, to prove whether someone was uh, angry committing a crime or no thank okay. you so that that's really interesting so in many cases you just have the like in the in the court case they say so and so committed a crime irato animal out of anger we don't know how they assessed this fact but in other cases we we have descriptions of uh, the facial expression or the way that the the body was uh, uh, presented itself sort of like the, the face um, moving forward these were all so in in medieval times there were a number of things that were considered to be signs of certain emotions some were connected to humors so for instance like a ruddy complexion like getting red in your face because of the moving of the humors in your body was considered as something connected to to anger uh, and also of course frowning th this type of signs could be a proof that someone committed a crime in a state of anger but i think most of the times it was based on the witnesses like we, we don't have anything written because they, they just asked and they said yes and you know they said for this and that and this reason or, or they didn't even have to say anything it was just the idea that it was believable that that person had acted in a state of anger because the witnesses knew the sort of interpersonal relationships between uh, the parties involved in the crime and, and everyone knew that they were enemies for instance this is something that they say sometimes like publicus inimicus like they were public enemies everyone knew that they hated each other so it's it's absolutely believable that the crime was committed in a state of anger and it, it is also valid for the opposite situation so someone who repents of their crimes and in some cases like we have amnesties for people so like they they're allowed to pay a much lower fine because they have repented and some of these people they, they committed crimes and then they were so sad about it, so contrite that they went on a pilgrimage to Assisi, to Rome, wherever. So that is a proof that they have repented for real, sort of. And of course, like you have to imagine that when the judges heard this story, they could kind of like assess the validity of the claim on, on the basis of the reputation of the person. So if this person was known to go to brothels, uh, gamble all the time, like they probably didn't go to a pilgrimage, right? So, you know, like th there's a lot about reputation that we cannot get at through the sources, but we have to think that in communities that were not as big, Siena at its height was like 50,000 people, they, they must have known. Local reputation was important. Yes, thank you. I wanted to ask particularly for, for the reputation and uh, how it was correlated to to proving uh, to proving crimes, and that's exactly what I've asked for. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tamada has a question. I'd like to meet you first of all. I hope you can hear me. You're a bit quiet, okay. but you're audible. Oh, okay. Nice to meet you, and thank you for interesting um, communication here. Uh, I'm just inspired uh, by your comment about Byzantine law and the factor of anger in Byzantine crime. Um, I explore Byzantine law, not uh, particularly criminal law, but I can remember one uh, article that deals with anger as um, uh, an aspect of the murder. So maybe. Um, I'm wondering also, and maybe it is uh, uh, the part a part of Byzantine crime in the late Byzantine period. So I think Ruth Macrides, professor, late unfortunately, uh, dealt with it in one article about law and asylum uh, in the Byzantine crime of murder. So maybe if you sometime in, in perspective uh, make some comparative study. Uh, and you're still interested about Byzantine law, I think it, it could be found there. That's, that's awesome. Do you remember the name of the of the author of the article? 
Yes, uh, Ruth McCreevis, Professor Ruth McCreevis. Ah, so okay. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm aware of her. Yes. That's, that's interesting, you see, because like, also there's not much about the history of emotions in Byzantium. As far as I know, there are very few people that work on this field, which is a shame because of course, like one has to understand also in the case of Byzantine law, whether, you know, there was this idea that emotions were not irrational, but they, they came from a sort of an evaluation of what was happening that was partly, at least partly rational, if not fully rational, which is the way in which the, the Western world was seeing emotions in that period. So it is really interesting. It would be interesting to see, you know, if that was the case also for, for Byzantine society. And I have uh, another small uh, comment uh, or question for you. It's about uh, 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 malediction and curses. Have you ever found something like that as an instrument for satisfaction of um, uh, the person who is injured or his family? or so. I can find in Byzantine uh, documents uh, from the period of 13th to 15th century formulas in private delicts uh, that uh, oh, bring uh, curses for somebody who injured uh, their property or uh, other similar stuff. So uh, I, I haven't understood everything, unfortunately, because the volume is a bit low. Are you asking me if people react to crimes by cursing their yes. aggressors? Yes. Sort of? uh, okay, no, I haven't different. seen anything. I mean, people insult each other all the time in Italy, uh, but we don't know why. We like in the court case, you just say like you just have the fact that so and so called this woman a bitch or this man a cuckold. We don't know why. Uh, something that is connected to insults and in a way like not really curses, but it, it is connected to to this idea of like reputation and obligations is uh, the practice known as improperare homicidium. So it, it's a it's a type of insult that was punished more severely in Siena and also in the other Italian communes, at least the majority of them. So it is the practice of like sort of rebuking someone for not having taken their revenge. So like you go to someone and you say you're a coward because you haven't you haven't avenged the murder of your father and you should. And that was considered more serious than a normal insult because it was, of course, conducive to a crime like it, it could lead someone to 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 take their revenge and, and and like the fact that it was punished much more severely than normal insults in my opinion is another sign that revenge was not socially acceptable my question is other way around is mm. some, uh, do you have some example that curse or malediction mm. is uh, an instrument for satisfaction of the person who is injured or so uh, no unfortunately no. We, no. We, I, i've never seen anything like that like uh, I mean, probably the formula. it 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 so in in the, was was this punished in Byzantine law? Like if you cursed someone, would no, you? No, it's an an instrument for uh, satisfaction. How mm -hmm. do I say? So when somebody uh, done done did some really bad deal to other people, to other person. Uh, it is a way to pardon, to, to uh, have satisfaction in, in his or her soul. You understand me? To forgive. Yeah, I do, I do, but uh, I, I, I have not found it in Italy because I guess, you know, this would still lead to being considered a coward. Like if you just curse someone and, you know, like you have to do something publicly to show yes. that you're reacting to, to the affront. Yes. Mm -hmm. Of course, I'm sure that some people couldn't, like if you were, for instance, attacked by a member of the elite and you were a poor person, of course, you couldn't go and take your revenge on them because they had huge families, a lot of resources like that was the ideal. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm really sure that revenge was not always taken, but we don't know how they coped with uh, mm -hmm. with this type, this type of situations, because, of course, what what we have is preaching from the friars in which they advise people to just forgive. Uh, they never hint at the fact that they might curse someone. They, they might, they, they just hint at the fact that they might 
harbor resentment in their heart for many, many years, and that leads to sin, but they don't talk about maledictions in particular. Okay, thank you. That's really interesting anyway, like, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I really feel like there is a different conception of sort yes. of. I have an impression that malediction in Byzantine documents is an instrument for satisfaction mm -hmm. uh, of injured a person, for example, or his family. That's that's really interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. Good this luck might, you might be not fully related, but it might be a sort of difference uh, in not just mentality, but the perception of virtue. Mm, because I, I remember, for example, uh, Leonora Neville writes about it uh, very interestingly in her Byzantine gender book. Uh, the clash of cultural values between Byzantines and crusaders who come because uh, crusaders see uh, being loud and full of emotions and very belligerent as being manly. And Byzantines perceive uh, public displays of emotion as womanly, as not being able to control oneself. And they have the perception, as she says, of the Crusaders just running around yelling like girls. While on the other hand, the Byzantine um, uh, courtly virtues, men who are in service of the empire as clerks, as high officials who don't uh, value their honor um, primarily by martial prowess, seem feminized to the crusaders who are used to a man's value being determined by the sword. And it's a complete case of misunderstanding. So maybe there's something along those lines here, because in Italy, it shows you as being a good man, a strong man, if you display your dominance, if you take revenge, while in Byzantium, maybe it would be taken as a sign of weakness, as succumbing to your emotions and so on. Yeah, absolutely. That That is an important factor of it. And we know that it is because the governments were aware of, of this idea that being manly meant to express your emotions very overtly and very aggressively. And they tried to counteract these by, for instance, limiting um, manifestations of, of um, like at funerals, for instance, uh, manifestations of anger or sadness or sorrow. Uh, because apparently they could degenerate quite a lot and, and, and get really rowdy and, and then lead to the to, to crimes. Uh, and they did that by saying that they were feminine behaviors, that, you know, crying too loudly and showing your sorrow too openly in, in the, on the occasion of funerals was something that women do. But we know that it's not true because, like, we have court cases in which men were fined for doing so, and, and it's basically mostly men that did it. So it was just reframed as feminine. So they were trying to do that, I guess, like finally they <laughs> they were like, maybe the Byzantines are right and, and we're a bit too, too rowdy. But, you know, it took a long time to become successful. Okay, thank you. And just one more short question. Is there any... Uh penitential terminology used by the state in court cases for crimes and so on. Because, for example, in some Serbian laws, we have uh, the word uh, sogreshenie, which means a sin, committing a sin used as a term for a crime, not the only term for a crime, but still. So is there something like that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So so there is like not not considering God, there is uh, um, like instigated by the devil. There is there is quite a lot. And then on the other hand, when the commune wants to be merciful, they use the expression intuitu pietatis et misericordia, so taking piety and mercy into account. So they say it. In some documents, they even say, we're following here the example of, of the Holy Roman Church that is merciful, that, you know, forgives, sinners so we're doing the same um so like in some cases it's it's quite an open reference to 
to sacramental confession and to, to the fact that it is an ecclesiastical concept. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions? If not, it remains to thank Lydia once again for this wonderful lecture. I think we've all gotten lots of ideas to think about and maybe we'll have other opportunities to talk to each other and to exchange ideas in the near future. So well, thank, thank you very much. Thank you again as well, because this was, I, I, I learned so much through the questions and it was really a great venue to, to present my research. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for your attention. And next week we have Professor Abramovic, but unfortunately the lecture will be in Serbian, so we, we can't invite you. But when we have something in English again, I'll let you know. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone, and good night. Bye.